What's up, what's up, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of The Michael Balco Show. I'm your host. You guys know, three years strong now, though. Three years strong. Three-year anniversary of The Michael Balco Show is today. Um, It's truly a blessing to be able to talk to all you guys all the time, interview all the awesome people I'm interviewing. Um, And we got a good one today. Um, Today, I'm joined by eight-year NFL veteran who spent time with the Pittsburgh Steelers, Buffalo Bills, um, he's one of just 12 players in Towson football history to play in the NFL. The one, the only, Jordan Dangerfield. How we doing, brother? I'm good. I'm good, Michael. How you doing, man? Thanks for having me. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. The answer to that question, as mm-hmm. always, for the listeners, is blessed and highly favored because like your that. situation could always be much worse. Could Absolutely. Be much Amen. Worse. Amen. So, I hear you. I hear that. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. But we got to do what we always do to start this episode. Rep the hometown, my boy. Tell us about your hometown, Royal Palm Beach, Florida. What makes it so unique? Oh, man. It's just, I mean, originally from Elmont, New York. You know, I got to show love out there to Elmont, New York. Born and raised. I moved down to Florida, Royal Palm Beach, Florida, when I was 14. Um, I was, it was any grade right before my high school career. So I did all of my high school down at Royal Palm Beach High School. And it was uh, very unique. You know, it was a uh, a uh, pretty new school. I think when I started, it was no more than uh, 10 years old. Around the time I started, it was no more than 10 years old. And then um, good football program. They had uh, they had a stack team. They had D1 running backs, D1 receivers, quarterbacks, everything. So it was, it was exciting. You know, big, big chain from New York to Florida. So I was very excited for it. And, you know, to just start chasing my dream to the NFL, I was all for it. Once my parents wanted to move down to Florida, I was all for it. And, um it was very unique. Like I said, we won uh, three district championships there. We, we, we were very successful in my high school career. Pretty much went to playoffs every year in high school, won district championships, and um, it was a blessing. Yeah, Florida football, it's different, bro. Florida high school football goes crazy. There's some dogs down there. Like, everyone talks about Texas and Cali, but, like, there's some dogs down there in Florida. Yeah, Florida has the best of high school football. I said it. Ooh. I said it. <laughs> That's a debate for a different day right there. I said it. That's crazy. That's crazy. Because uh, Pennsylvania, cool. Pennsylvania got some ballers well, PA too. Great, too yeah, PA, PA definitely has some great football in PA. Absolutely. Facts, facts. I was not one of those <laughs> good ones. I was like the ride the pine guy. We're pretty good. I was like D1, like clapper, you know? Yeah. <laughs> water boy, D1 water boy. All right. So you won three district championships, intercepted 18 passes in your high school career. Um, yeah, for whatever reason, bro, you were overlooked by a ton of the top notch schools. Um, tell us about your recruiting process out of high school, what it kind of was like for you and um, how you ended up at Hofstra. Oh, man, it was, it, was, it was frustrating. Like you said, you know, I just felt like I had a, a pretty great and successful, healthy high school career, you know, um, stats averaged out to five star, four stars, you name it. I was competing with the best of the best down here in South Florida. But um, I was a late bloomer. You know, I, I was small. I was kind of short. I was underweight. I wasn't strong enough. You know, so I, I think that's why I got overlooked. You know, um, I did have um, an offer from Hofstra. I had an offer from FIU. And I uh, had um, UMass. Those are my only three uh, uh, offers. And then FIU ended up um, getting pulled off the table because I took too long to commit. And they wanted me to play corner. I was playing corner until my senior high school. So they wanted me to play corner, you know, have a physical corner because they played a lot of cover too. Gotcha. So I, I took too long to commit to FIU. So then they called me one day and, um, you know, they were pretty much like, hey, you know, we got to kind of pull a scholarship off the table. Nothing you didn't do. But, you know, we just have a lot of corner commits. So, you know, I was frustrated with that. You know, I thought that was kind of my football career right there, you know. But then Hofstra and UMass came along, to, took visits to both of them. Ended up at Hofstra. That was pretty much from um, not even 20 minutes from where I grew up in Elmont, New York. So it was like going back home. So it was, it was, it was a blessing, you know, like, and I, I, senior year, I was probably like, like I said, senior year, I was lying on my highlight tape. I said I was like 5'11", 170. I was probably more like 5'8", 5'9", 160, soaking wet, mm. <laughs> you know? So, you know, see, seeing those things, you know, it, it motivates me though, you know, and all that made me who I am today. Yeah, most definitely. And, and you went, to Hofstra you balled out immediately like you got to play right away which is so it's so uncommon these days like seeing dudes come straight out of high school and playing like I mean maybe it's more common for like the four or five star guys but you had no stars and you went out there and you played right away um and you two, played I, well, I had two stars it was two. I had two. I'll take two I'll take two my bad my bad my I'll research take, my research stars. was failing me my yeah, research was failing good. Me. I'll take my two though all right we'll take the two stars two stars my bad yeah. <laughs> you still played. Still underdog. Still underdog. see that's what we talk about right now that's underdog 
I don't know if you saw, but I saw something about OBJ talking about he's been on the dog forever. I understand, you know, you weren't given everything, but that's not underdog, you know. I mean, you got a chip on your shoulder. I, I would call that having a chip on your shoulder, you know, having yeah. a lot more to prove. I wouldn't call that an underdog story over there, but yeah, you know, he's having a great career as well. Yeah, no, you you really do have an underdog story, bro. I mean, undrafted to eight years in the league. I mean, we'll talk about that a little yeah, yeah, bit yeah. further as we get down, but but back to back to college. You played eight games at Hofstra, and then their football program just like folded. Or from what I read, at least, which is crazy. Yeah. Um, and then you joined Towson. So tell us about playing on a team that wound up folding. Did you know it was coming? How difficult was it for you, especially considering the early success you had? Oh, I, I had no clue. You know, like I said, um, my dad passed right before I went to college, August 1st. You know, college started camp, like, I think, August 7th or less than a week away from that that day or whatever. But, you know, I thought I was committing to my college for the next four years. You know, I was going to be there steady, have my career at, at uh, Hofstra. You know, especially before my dad passed, I thought everything was good. Still go there, like you said, play the true freshman after my dad passed. I still went up there, started on time, did everything I had to do, stay focused in school as well. You know, it, it, was, it was a tough semester for me. And then um, played the true freshman. I think I had two interceptions, a few tackles, a few big plays. And then um, we actually, I think we were six and five, I believe. If not, if not we were five and six. But either way, it wasn't a terrible season. You know, we were at around 500. We were just like a few plays away from each game winning because we lost a lot of those games by a possession. So I felt like the program was very promising. I felt like, you know, we were going in the right direction. After the season, it was like November, December, right before winter break, you know, we just get a phone goes off, we get an urgent team meeting at 8.30, blah, 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 in the, in the field house or whatever. You know, so everybody's like, what? You know, I'm thinking coaching change. Everybody's thinking coaching change. We're going to get a new head coach, blah, blah, blah. You know, we get there. You, it's, it's a lot of, a lot of um, business people in there, a lot of shirt and ties, a lot of suits in there. So we're like, oh, what's going on? You know, head, uh, they get up there, you know, head coach gets up there, the AD gets up there, talking, talking, talking. And then pretty much, long story short, the key words were, Instead of eliminating, you know, six to eight different programs, we just chose to eliminate the football program, to discontinue the football program. Instead of doing six to eight different sports, we chose to do the football program. And then everybody's ch- shocked, like, is this real life? You know, it was, it was a shock, and it was like, dang, my football career is done. Like, what, what now? Like I said, I had an offers coming out of high school. Nobody wanted me out of high school. You know, I did just play a college season, but, like, nobody had me. You know, nobody wanted me out of high school. So I'm like, oh, my, my football career is done. You know, uh, I was, it's over. Stop crying, calling my brother, calling my mom, calling everybody, crying and everything, trying to see what I'm going to do. And then um, it was it was a tough process. Like I said, after that, it became pretty much like the whole recruiting process over. You know, it, it was open it was open door thing. You know, we had like 20 schools in the next day from FCS to D1 schools. And um, everybody was pretty much offering. You know, I had, I had ended up with – twice as many offers as I had out of high school. But, you know, a lot of them were FCS. But there were a few D1 offers. But a lot of the D1 schools, it was like Syracuse, UCF, USF, smaller D1 schools. But they wanted me to start in August. But I was trying to start starting that spring, you know. And then a lot of the FCS schools were talking about Towson. My own matter, my love, my Towson love. You know, um, they came in, you know, they saved the day. Uh, they, they they drove up like at least every other day. It was about I think a three to four hour drive from um, Towson to New York to Hofstra. So I mean they drove up multiple times. They drove up to even pick me up. They bring me to my official visit to Towson. You know they they did a lot of things that that were like, man they really want me. You know and then um, I was like this might be it. You know so I took my visit. I love my visit. It, it was hard too because it was around the recruiting process. So every team is waiting for the commitments to see who's gonna commit, who's not gonna commit. So it was, it was a tough time. And like I said, it was hard to take visits. Everybody's on winter break, you know. So I, I want my gut feeling. You know, it felt like home. I want my gut feeling. I want my gut instinct. You know, the gut never lies. <laughs> Not for me. So I just followed the signs and then I, I fell in love with Towson and, and Towson became my new home. Yeah, I couldn't imagine. I mean, thank God you got to play your freshman year, bro, because like, Otherwise, man, I don't even I don't even know what the story looks like. I'm sure there was probably quite a few dudes who maybe didn't end up at anywhere, which is like, you know, horrible to think about, you know, like you you commit and like you said, you're committing for a place for four years. And then, you know, for someone like you who really didn't have any other options, it's just like, bro, if you didn't play that year, that's tough. That's tough. But I'm so thankful it worked out. Um, 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, no, absolutely. And then uh, as far as that, you know, I think the, I could have stayed at Hofstra and finished academically. Mm-hmm. You know, I did have academic scholarship still there, but you know, I wanted to go play football and, and finish school somewhere else. I did. I just didn't want to be there. It was uh, didn't want to be there after that. You know, it was definitely yeah. definitely a bad feeling that you didn't want to be around. And um, yeah, yeah like, some guys, yeah, some guys stayed there. They they finished out school. Some guys didn't get offers. You know, it was tough. It was definitely yeah. a tough time. And I couldn't even picture that time. I don't know the transfer portal. Back then, I don't know how that would have been. You know, <laughs> that would have been crazy. Now, would they have the transfer portal and everything? Yeah, yeah. I mean, rightfully so. You deserve to play football somewhere. And I mean, in hindsight, it's a good thing. It's a good thing you did. Um, you took your talents to Towson, like you talked about in 2010. Had a remarkable career for the Tigers, logging 258 tackles, earned All American honors. What was it like transitioning to a new school? And what things did you kind of do personally to help you with that transition? Uh, at first it was rough because, you know, like that I was at a at two schools in less than a year, you know, it was, I was at Hofstra four or five months and then I was just starting another school. So it was tough that the whole first semester was tough, you know, it was just adjusting about adjusting and, and learning a new program for that whole spring semester. And, um, I think after that, that summer, like going into that 2010 season started to, you know, get, get, get back under my feet, you know, get myself back together. I felt like, and, um, it was rough, and I could, I could I could tell you a little secret. You know, a little secret right now is that um, Towson is in the CA, which was in the same division and conference as Hofstra, the CA. I didn't know how I didn't know Towson was in the conference That's when crazy. I was at Hofstra. I didn't. I was a freshman. I was just doing what I was told. You know, trying to do everything right. I was trying to be the golden boy. You know, I was just locked in on week one week at a time, one week at a time. You know, and school. So. Um, I found out about Towson, you know, when they came up. That's exactly when I found out about Towson. I didn't even know they were in the CA. I think they that year they went like two and nine. That 2010 year we went one and ten. You know, a lot of people were asking me, "Why are you going to Towson?" Like a lot of guys trying to go to the same schools together because you know they multi- they offered multiple of us together, so we were all trying to go to the same school. You know, I was the only one that chose Towson. I was the only one that chose that and wanted to go to Towson because I mean, Towson told me they was like, "Look, we have a squad." We have a solid defense. I feel like we're just missing one guy. One, 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 one guy safety. We have a safety. We have corners. Blah, blah, blah. We need one more safety. You know, so I, was, I, I believed them, you know. But they didn't give me my job, though. You know, I had to go there and work. I had to work my butt off. You know, I had to go work for my spot. You know, I, it didn't take long, but I had to go work for it. You know, they, I was still an underdog when I got there. and had to work for it all. Yeah. Yeah, most definitely. And, you know, following your college career, you declared for the 2013 NFL draft. Um, you went undrafted, but was signed by the Buffalo Bills. What, what kind of like chip did that add to your shoulder? You know, kind of your whole story so far has just been like, you know, being overlooked, you know, stuff like that. And yet again, here we are transitioning to your pro football career, getting overlooked yet again. Um, you get signed by the Bills. Um, what was it like transitioning from college to the NFL? And, you know, kind of what was it like to reach the pinnacle of, you know, football as a whole? You know, you you're in the top 0.001% of, you know, everybody at that point of humanity, you know, reaching the NFL, even as an undrafted free agent. What was it like to get there? Tell us about the chip. Tell us about that experience as a whole. Uh, it was a, it was a blessing. You know, like I said, I finished up at Towson, did three years, uh, all American, all CA, all those honors. And um, had the stats, had, I feel like I had the film. Uh, I, Finally got a little taller, bigger. You know, my size was just like everybody else, D1 by now, running still, still running good. So, I mean, I, I was still a shock, you know, um, coming out. I was hearing, you know, I could be any, any day three, anytime, you know, four, five, six, seven, you know. So I, I was expecting day three no matter what. Obviously, for my story, my history, being at Towson, you know, it's all politics, it's all the logo helmet. So I already had that in my head, the, the chip already. You know, I thought I could definitely be drafted like – late rounds you know i didn't see why i couldn't but as far as that i heard it's actually kind of better to go on draft because you kind of pick where you want to fit in a little bit and you're not forced into a a, a system that you don't want to be in and you kind of like pick you know kind of like picking the college at the end of the day yeah it's almost yeah. like i kind of view it as like almost just with all the people i've talked to they they kind of viewed it as you know, you're a free agent, obviously. So you get to pick where you're going. And then it's almost like you get a just a natural fan base just cheering yeah. for the underdog. Yeah, and then, yeah. I mean, you still have probably the same commitment level as like from the team anyways, as like yeah. a sixth or seventh round pick would anyways. So. Right, 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 right. But yeah, that was great. And then teams were calling me 
teams were calling me during the draft around, you know, the, the those six, the six, seventh round. Teams were calling me like, we got a, we got these picks coming up. You know, we might we might get you. Da, da, da. But if not, we want to bring you for a preferred uh, free agent, a priority free agent. So a- after the draft, mm-hmm. n- nobody drafted me, obviously. And it was uh, two teams. It was it was it was the Raiders and um, Buffalo, the two teams like trying to bid on me and trying to get me. And um, Oakland was far. I felt like, and then Buffalo was still in New York. So I feel like East Coast New York is a sign still. You know. Got got to go the gut feeling. I actually had a, a, a one on one of my coach from Towson. I was actually up in Buffalo too. I had um, mutual friends. I think going to Buffalo, and I think they drafted two safeties that year. I think they drafted two safeties late, late. So I'm like, I like competing. Let's compete. Let's go. You know, I, I was all for it. They, they obviously looking for a younger guy or like you know like a rookie. They're gonna keep one of us. There's three three rookies. They're gonna keep one of us. You know, so and it might even be another free agent one. So it might have been like four of us. But I like competing, though. So, but at the end of the day, it comes down to politics, and a lot of teams like keeping their draft picks. I felt like I had a great camp in, in Buffalo. I was healthy and uh, learned a lot. I was thankful for my opportunity when I got to Buffalo, you know, because it helped me out in the long run. Because that's how Pittsburgh ended up uh, finding me. What's the culture like up in Buffalo, man? They just—I feel like they've had an elite defense for like. 15 years now <laughs> what's it like up there man and is there any like p- player in particular in buffalo that kind of took you under under his wing and showed you the ropes a little yeah well um buffalo I, when i was there i think it, doug marone was the head coach i think that was his first year if not his one and only year he might have been there two years i believe but he wasn't there yeah. for long and he was fresh out of college so it kind of felt like i was still in college when i went up there honestly you know he, i don't think he kind of understood how to you know run a NFL team because it's it's different. It's a lot different. You know, you, you got grown men that are making a lot of money, and then you don't have college kids that's trying to hold on to a scholarship, and you know, you know, looking up to you as a father. Technically, in college, you know, that's how you look up to a coach, it, like your man in your life for those years. You know, so it, it was different. The culture was there, like you said. Defense always stacked. The defense was stacked tremendously. They had a they had some big time guys. You know, it was great to, go, to learn from those guys. You know, I had, behind I had safety that I think uh, Denora Cersei was there, that Aaron Williams. You know, those are those are great safeties to learn from. You know, I learned a lot from them that time. And um, as far as somebody taking me under my wing, it, it's crazy how, how how life works because Mopes, my guy Arthur Mopes, was there. He was in Buffalo with me too. So even, even when I was in, I was picking his brain from when I was in Buffalo. You know, we always had small talk, and he's a JMU guy, a CA guy, an FCS guy, a small school guy. So. From there, we just from from that from like day one, we kind of set it off because we knew what it what, what it what it takes to survive in the NFL. So he always been a he always been my guy. Whenever I need advice, whenever I need anything, call him for anything. You know, he's got me for sure. That's what's up. That's what's up. So after your time in Buffalo, you found a long term home in Pittsburgh with the Steelers. Um, shout out, shout out the Steelers. <laughs> Where you uh, you saw extended success. You were even named a special teams captain in 2020. How much does the city of Pittsburgh mean to you personally? And what was it like getting to literally play meaningful playoff football every single year? Oh, it was a, it was a blessing. Like I said, that after that Buffalo coming, a Buffalo coming right after training camp in August, and they saw that it was September, October, November, December, four months. I was working out two times a day, Monday through Friday, two times a day, Monday through Friday, literally waiting for a phone call, nothing. Radio silence, you know, teams that have them on the board, radio silence, no workouts, nothing. So honestly, I was I was getting I was getting ready to uh go overseas. I was really going to Italy and sign with the seamen. I was about to sign with them and go overseas starting in the following year. Come January, beginning of January, Pittsburgh calls. You know, they call me, they call me for a workout. I'm like, I'm ready. I've been ready. I've, I've been I've been uh <laughs> I've been grinding all year waiting for this. So I go out, I go, I get up there. I mean, I was prepared, I was they, they 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 told me that was the best workout they had all all, all season. You know, definitely starting a new season, they the best workout they had. So I signed my 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 deal, my one year deal, my exclusive right, not exclusive rights, but just the um what do they call that again? I forget. I signed a, I signed a lot of them too. Yeah, I don't. That's not a lot of them too. It's a, it's a like temporary future one. futures yeah, contract. Yeah, 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 the future contract. There you go. I signed a lot of those. <laughs> so the futures contract. They signed me a futures contract. And um, it was it was like um, a play from Buffalo that I found out that stuck out to them. That's how they found me because a play from Buffalo I had a goal line stand in one of the preseason games, and uh, I guess that's how they came across me. And uh, that's what they wanted to see what I look like in person, how I move. You know, they wanted to get to know me a little more. 
So I wanted to show them myself a little more. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, most definitely. All right, gear up, because this is our uh, it's one of my favorite segments to do. We got that rapid fire segment coming up. So you can answer them quick if you want to, but it's just like random, spontaneous questions to let people get to know do we, you. Do we have a time limit? No, no time limit. Right, no cool. time limit. Can I All tell right. you? So I want to go back to Pittsburgh, though. Oh. I'm talking about a lot. So I'll go back to Pittsburgh when they signed me in January. You know, a lot of people don't know. Like, you know, I've, I've been cut like six times from Pittsburgh, too. But I was there for seven years, from 14 to 20. You know, I'm thankful for my time there. I love my time there. I love Pittsburgh, for sure. But, I mean, it, it was, it was the behind the scenes and stuff that you have to go through to try to, you know, live a dream. It, it's, it's pretty intense, you know. It's pretty it's pretty a, a, a mental challenge, for sure. You know, I've been cut up and down. I got cut in 2014, 2015. You know, practice squad 2015, 2016. Got cut in 2017. Brought back. You know, so finally at 26, I started sticking. And I was there for seven years. So I'm thankful for all my years. The worst one, the worst time I got cut, um, I think it was 20, 20, 2015. It was 2015. I was about to drive up the training camp from Florida to Pittsburgh, about two hours into my drive. And um, I get a, I get the phone call, 412 area code. I'm like, I hate 412. When any, any 412 number calls me, I still get the feeling, honestly. Whenever I see a 412 phone number, I get a feeling to my gut. It's just crazy. I, it's indescribable. But anyway, I pick up. I'm like, hey, what's going on? Da -da, small talk. Hey, I'm driving out to uh, you know, Pittsburgh right now. What's going on? Da -da. Uh, we got to cut you. We have to release you. I'm like, what? For what? You know, they had an injury alignment. I think they had somebody alignment that got hurt or needed surgery. So they needed a, a body. They said, we just need a camp. We need alignment for a camp. You know, we need a camp body. Lyman, you know, we know we know what you can do. We know you. You know, stay ready. We're gonna call you back. What well, we need you. You know. Thankful enough, you know, two weeks later, I think they only had like two healthy safeties that year. And that's the year we had the um the Hall of Fame game against the Vikings. You know, they flew me out, they flew me out Saturday. I played most of the game on that Sunday. <laughs> you know, and I and I was ready and I played like the whole game and I did good. So, <laughs> hey, stay ready so you don't gotta get ready. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, that's crazy. That's wild. Yeah. I would be so mad too, bro. Two hours deep, got the whole car packed up. Bro. Yeah, it's crazy. Crazy. Had to make a U-turn. Ruthless, bro. Ruthless. Yeah. It's a crazy business. I mean, that's just a little bit of it. It's crazy things happen. Crazy things. I believe it. I believe it. All right, you ready for this rapid fire segment? Yes, sir. Let's do it. All right. They're not necessarily like questions you have to answer quick, but they're just like really random questions. So here we go. First one, would you rather wrestle an alligator in the water or a bear on land? Bear on land. Why? Because like, first of all, I can't hold my breath that long. Two, alligator, when the alligator's in the water, they bring you down to the bottom and they start spinning you. So oh, I, doubt, really? I, doubt, I doubt I'd be able to get out of that. As far as a bear, I feel like I could, maybe I'll run a bear and just start switching directions and maybe uh, shake him up. <laughs> you know? I'm not trying to like really fight the bear, but... I'll try to get away from the bear. I think I get away from a bear better than an alligator. I have probably asked about 10 to 15 NFL players that same exact question, and they always say alligator. And uh -huh. they said that they said they would drag the gator onto the land. And then I think it's just controversial because then it's not abiding, abiding by the rules, which I clearly stated in the yeah, I, I, guarantee, well, I guarantee a lot of those guys aren't from Florida. I guarantee. <laughs> I guarantee not a lot from Florida, and they don't know about gators. Yeah, yeah. probably not. Probably not. I was born in Jacksonville. I know about them gators. Yeah. It, ain't, it ain't no thing out there. No. All right. What is one super ordinary thing that you've never done? That I've never done? Yeah. Um, I've never been um, hunting. I want to. That's on my bucket list. I've never been camping. That's on my bucket list. Um. I've left the country before, you know, I did that stuff. But yeah, those are the two things that like I, I feel like they've been on my bucket list for a while and I felt like I should have been did those things. Yeah, so those are at the top of my list. Probably, probably. <laughs> All right. I had I had one dude one time say that he's never been bowling and I was like, you never did what? He never went bowling, bro. Oh, bowling, what? <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, those bro. are the two things, those are two things that have been on my bucket list forever. And I had a lot of friends, a lot of teammates that hunt and go camping. I never been, and I always wanted to go. So I'm kind of disappointed and mad at myself, but it'll, it'll get done, God willing. That's what's up. That's what's up. Now that I got the free time. <laughs> yeah, word, word. <laughs> if you weren't playing football, what would you be doing? Um, 
a good question. I was, I mean, growing up, like it was always football, 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 and baseball. You know, I want to go play professional sports. You know, I never really thought about a plan B. I would say, you know, people should plan B if it doesn't work out. You know, growing up, so I always had the mindset like, and you ask me about plan B, that means you don't believe I'm gonna get there. You're like, you don't believe in me. So that made me, even when people ask plan B, I always wanted to prove them wrong as well. You know, but I always told people like, after I get done playing the game of football, because I was like, I was gonna play. So, it, so you can't play football forever. So you're gonna have to have a plan for after football. I, wouldn't, I didn't really call it a plan B. I just said after football, you know? And um, as far as that, you know, if I wasn't for football, I mean, my dad was a firefighter. So if I didn't actually go to football, I felt like I probably would end up going that route. You know? That's dope. That's That's just dope. Family. My mom was a firefighter. My older brother's a firefighter. So, you know, I felt like it would have been along that line. And, you know, who, who knows? You know, I, I, could, I could still do that. So maybe I could live two dreams. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, who you bump into on the pregame playlist? Uh, oh, it's Meek Mill. Meek Mill, Meek Mill, Meek Mill. Oh, wait, that's my go-to, though. I got Meek Mill, Future. I got Kodak. I got a um, nice little playlist. You know, I mix it up. I, I put it on a shuffle. I have, have a few guys on there. I expected that from a from a safety, honestly. Like, yeah. that's just some tear your head off type <laughs> stuff. <right? laughs> that's, that's what's up. That's what's up. All right, that wraps up the rapid fire segment. So you're, yeah, the pressure's off. Pressure's off. <laughs> let's go back to your time in Pittsburgh. Let's talk yeah. Mike Tomlin. Let's talk Mike Tomlin. He's widely considered to be one of the best coaches to play for. Um, player, player coach. Everybody knows that who watches football. Um, can you attest to how great of a coach he is and tell us what your experience playing under Coach Tomlin's like? Yeah, I mean, he's authentic. You know, what you hear is what you get. You know, everybody, what everybody says is true. You know, that's my guy. That's my guy, man. I mean, he gave me opportunity. You know, he's a CA guy as well, woman Mary. So he understood, he understood exactly where I came from, what I was coming from. He understood probably how bad I wanted it, honestly, because, you know, I'm sure he wanted it as bad coming out of William Mary too. And I'm sure he still has that fire in him, which is why he is who he is today as well, you know. So, I mean, like, like I said, he gave me an opportunity. That's all I needed. And um, whenever I have to go to him for anything, I have a question or anything, you know, he's a big family guy as well. Great guy. Always around a locker room, weight room, training room. Whenever you're in the building, you see him, you know, and I mean, like I said, I, when I was in Buffalo, I, I didn't see that in the upstairs or with the head coach at that time back then when I was in Buffalo in 2013. You know, I barely, I barely saw the head coach. I barely saw the GM. You know, I barely saw anybody. I just felt like, you know, so just to go from there to, to Pittsburgh, it was like nine days for me, you know, and then, you know, I was in Pittsburgh for seven years. I didn't really have to see any other uh, franchises after that, See, had to see any other programs after that. So. And the way it's ran, it, it's laid back. It's how I like it. You know, it's fun. You know, everything is better when you're winning, for sure. So, yeah, you know, like, and like you asked earlier, you know, how, how it felt to play for, like, you know, winning football every year. You know, so to get back to that question, you know, it, it was great. You know, like I said, we, offense is good. Defense is good. You know, I, I know my role when I was on special teams, but, you know, if they needed me on defense, I'm not to go in there. You know, I embraced my role. You know, I just worked while I waited. Every time I got the opportunity to play defense, I felt like I did what I had to do. And um, to live out my dream and help help the team win at, at, the, at those times, you know, I'm I'm three and zero as a starter. A lot of people don't know that. Three yes, sir. I'm three and Yeah. Yes, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. Man, Mike Tomlin's a guy that I've always wanted to have on the pod. So, like, what's up? Slide me that number. No, right, right, right. Hey, hey, we having like a com regular conversation. That's one thing, you know. Like, he'll have a conversation. You know, it's just like talking to one of your one of your boys, honestly. And, yeah. You know, and then you know, and then the. Other thing I really loved about him, like he's gonna challenge you. He's gonna challenge you to be the best you, you know, on and off the field. You know, if he doesn't think you're you're, you're playing good on defense or doing what you your job, he's gonna call you out and he's gonna call you out in front of the whole team. And you know that that's I feel like that's what makes Tomlin who he is. You know, and that that's why the Steelers are the Steelers. I feel like you know because of him. You know, as as far as as long as he's staring the ship, I feel like you know Steeler Nation they won't really have. Much to worry about. I feel like they'll be contenders every year, no matter what. They'll be contenders with, with uh, Thomas Standard Chip. You know, yes, he's, he's going to challenge you. That's what, he's going to challenge the guys to be the best they can be, you know, and, and he's going to end the jail together, you know. He's going to drive it. Most definitely. Most definitely. I got to ask you, though. I know yeah. I know this wasn't on the script that I sent you, but yeah. just because we're on the topic of Mike Tomlin, yeah, my boy, that playoff game against the Ravens, did he know he was that close to the on the field? <laughs> Now, for what I know, nah, no, I don't know. He wasn't. He wasn't though. I and that was, that was, I think, that was the year, but the year right before I got there. But of course, you know, 
talk about it all the time. You know, come we play the Ravens twice a year, so it always comes up. You know, so no, he didn't know. I'm not a Ravens fan. What I know, yeah, for what I know. Hey, hey, going back to Towson, I was on both sides because you know I was at Baltimore right there at Towson, five minutes away from Towson. So like, it, it was it was cool seeing both of those sides, but I like the black and yellow side better. Yeah, I I would say so because that yeah. was the much more successful side. <laughs> I like the black and yellow side better. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, all right. What's the next question I got for you? Okay. Um, what's the funniest NFL locker room moment that you can share? The funniest one? It was, I guess it's kind of locker room because it was, it was like during a training camp. Like one of my funniest counts. moments. It yeah, counts. all right, cool. Because right, cool. we, we about to get ready for the, night, the nighttime team meeting and we in La Trobe. And, you know, they got they got these little flimsy plastic folding chairs. I mean, like literally, like they, they were from like the 90s probably, early 2000s, like those type of folding chairs. Oh, word. And my man Cam Hayward sat down and fell, broke the chair. I was dying. I was dying. And I think that was right before. I think that was right before we were about to um, demonstrate uh, Madden, a new Madden. Usually we get to Madden a little early. Yeah. And then you know, somebody plays it in front of the team, blah, blah, blah. So I was, I was right before that, too. So I was dying when that happened. <laughs> that agility so, rating. Plenty of moments, though. Over those years, plenty of moments. But that's definitely one that sticks out. Yeah, that's funny, bro. That's like that actually happened to me one time on on live a live yeah. podcast with Morton Anderson. Um, it was my first ever podcast I recorded, bro. Mm -hmm. This day, this day, three years ago, actually, um, <clears throat> I was sitting here interviewing Morton Anderson, and my chair broke, bro, live, and it was it was wild. It was wild. <laughs> <laughs> it was wild. It's a little embarrassing, you know. Definitely, a little embarrassing. What happened? It's all good though. It's all good. It builds character. It builds character. <laughs> <laughs> Who is the best player you've ever played with and against in your entire career? Like two different people? You want two different people? Sure. But playing with all around, AB. AB is definitely the best athlete. I mean, AB is AB. I mean, the numbers don't lie. The film don't lie. You know? So that's there. And then what was the other one? Uh, best you've oh, ever played, played against. against. Played against? Um... Also, AB. No. <laughs> yeah, I mean that that would be it. But I, I, I want to try to find like somebody like a like an opponent. I want to try to find like an opponent. Um, uh, there's a lot. I mean, every week, every week somebody has somebody. You know, as far as me, what's the name? Is hard to tackle from uh, Cincy running back. Oh, Mixon. Mixon, yeah, he hard to tackle. He he a little shifty. So that would probably be one of them for sure. Bet bet. Man, how do you see the how do you see the AFC North playing out here in the next few years, man? With the with the Bengals on the rise and the Lamar Jackson situation, um, you know the Ravens are trying to build a little something out there, and then obviously Pittsburgh, you can never count them out with Mike Tomlin. How do you kind of see the the AFC North shaping up to be like I don't know in the next three to five years? Yeah, uh, shoot, coming down to that last week of football, everybody playing at the same time or that last week. <laughs> That last weekend, everybody played at the same time. That's what I see. It. That's it. Every every year, you know, it's gonna come down to a to a game or two. It's gonna yes. be it's gonna, it's gonna be AFC North ball for sure. The old yes, school sir. old school fashion AFC North football, I think. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, tell us about a time in your life, whether it's on the field or off the field, that you've had to overcome adversity, and how'd you do so? Yeah. Um, well, I would say I started facing a lot of my adversity right after pretty much obviously high school. You know, um, had some during high school, but you know, I had my, I was still, you know, living with my parents. So I feel like after that, like when adversity like really starts, though, because like you're kind of by yourself, you're on your own a little bit, and you know, it's, it's how you challenge, get challenged by the adversity and how you respond to it. So I mean, my mine happened right, right away. Like I said, right before I went to Hofstra, my dad passed away, August first, two thousand nine, right before I was going to college. So that was my first taste right there. Um. Right after that, Hofstra dropping the program. That was my other taste. And then um, bouncing back without football and without my dad and trying to find a way to to persevere through it all and, and find a way. Yeah. And, uh, definitely uh, keep, keep, keep faith in the, mo in the most high, you know. Definitely uh, keep in faith. You know, I'm a big guy. I'm like, everything happens for a reason. You know, it, everything happens for a reason. Like, you might not know what it is, but it's gonna, the answer is going to come sooner or later, you know, uh, for, for, like, why it happened. So that, that's my, I live by that. Everything happens for a reason, you know, believe to achieve too as well. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Who is your biggest inspiration? 
my biggest inspiration, it was about my parents. My parents, both my mom and dad. Like I said, my mom, well, my mom was a, she was a retired New York City detective and my dad retired FDNY. You know, both of them were at 9-11. You know, um, as I got older, I, I kind of realized what they were doing and how they pretty much obviously put their life on the line every day. Mm -hmm. And um, that was, it was very inspiring. You know, I definitely had to honor them. I think uh, my cause, my cleats, I had got some custom cleats and I had honored both of them. So that they're definitely my inspiration. What they did to provide for like me and my brothers and my sisters mm -hmm. is definitely a uh, motivation for me. Yeah, dude, that's awesome. The honor them with the my cause, my cleats too. That's yeah. sick. That's sick. Um, what is one piece? This is the last question I have for you. What and it's the question I always wrap up every episode with. What is one piece of advice that if you had to, you know give to anybody listening, whether they're a young athlete in high school right now, or whether they're just, you know, an average Joe with a nine to five, um, what's that one piece of advice that you would give to them? Don't settle and um, don't take no for an answer. Don't quit. All that's like all together, you know, like use everything. Like you might get told no plenty of times, plenty of times, plenty of times. But you have motivation to keep going and to, to get where you got to go and get to your dream, you know. And I, it's like I, I, I say this, and I, like I'm, I'm talking to myself now because you know, like I said, I'm adjusting to life after football, and um, you know, it's things that got to have to get done, and you know, I got to keep doing, what I got to do to provide for my family. So I gotta actually, I needed that for myself right now, you know, telling myself that like, don't take no for an answer. You know, you might fail at something, but keep going, keep going, keep going. Don't settle, don't quit, and don't let anybody tell you that you can't do anything. Yes, and sir. It, it might be cliche because you always hear, it, but it, it's the truth. You know, it's the truth. Yeah. And then, because like once you get there, it's just that it's, it's just so much sweeter once you get there after somebody told you that you couldn't do it. Yeah, no, it really is the truth, man. It really is. And I mean, I, I say the same thing, and I know my words don't hold the same weight that yours do, but you know, just coming out, dude, just live life, man. Like, mm -hmm. try, try to find positivity in the little things, like, you know, like just looking at like your wife and like, she's just mm -hmm. smiling and just happy and content, bro. Like that's just, it's yeah. something that's just like, you can't put a price tag on that. You can't right. like, you can't put anything on it, bro. It's just like one of those crazy moments that like when your time comes, bro, you'll get to experience that. And you'll know that like, bro, that's what you live for. You know, Absolutely. it's wild. Um, thank you so much, Jordan, for hopping on the show today. Where can we find you at on social media? Absolutely. I appreciate it. Appreciate it. You can find me at, at Dangerfield, double underscore on Instagram and uh, Twitter. Yes, sir. Thank you so much for hopping on the show, man. We're super pumped to see what your future holds for you. Um, Eight-year NFL vet, played for the Steelers, the Bills. And uh, thank you so much once again for hopping on the show. Thank you all for listening for three years. That's crazy. Hey, three hey years. congrats on that, man. That's big, man. Thank you for having me. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Happy anniversary. Yes, sir. God bless everybody. Peace. Appreciate it, Mike.